Hello and welcome. I am Charlie Hutton and I am here joined by Lucinda Green. We are here today with Horse and Hound and Pet Plan Equine and we are doing our top tips, aren't we Lucinda? We certainly are for all three phases. This part is on cross country. So Lucinda, I am very much out of my comfort zone right now. So now you know how I feel in the dressage. <laughs> I am hoping that you can talk us through uh, walking through the course and I'm assuming the alternatives. If one needs to get themselves out of trouble, where, where do you start? What's your work pearls of wisdom? I think probably walking the course is, is, is one of the biggest sciences. I always feel that Cross country is a science and an art. I always feel you've got to remember the horse has never ever seen any of the fences you're asking him to jump before. So you need to remember your first impression as you walk up to the fence. In an ideal world at a big three day event it'll be three times I'll walk it and that first time is just to get a, a lay of the land in my eye and what the horse is going to see. The second time is to plan every possible route and think of all plan B, C, D, all the alternatives that I might need. Work out what point you need to start getting, preparing the horse to get the speed that you want for the fence, um, what point you need to have that preparation by, so that oak tree I need to start, that elm tree if you can tell the difference, I need to have the pace that I want, all those sort of nit, nitpicking sciences. So when does he first see the fence? He's seen it, but has he computed it very well actually, well done. He looks between his legs as he goes over the top. Well ridden, well ridden, super. Okay, so we have walked the course. You've done all your alternate routes. The next phase, I would imagine, would be cantering down to the first fence. Uh, so please, any tips, any, any advice um, getting us through the start of the course in particular and you know, getting us off to hopefully a good footing? Again, every horse is different and some of them need to be fired out the start box. Uh, if you do that, you could run the risk of them not going in it the next time because, because it got rather a sort of uh, fright with you kicking them out so hard. So you have to be a little bit clever how you come out of that start box, but you can sometimes lose a competition by a point something of a second and it can be between the start box and the first fence because a lot of horses need to have a little time. So it's quite a clever thing. You're setting yourself up for the rest of the course. So you need to do what your horse needs. My feeling is they've got to go. You must have fingers that can go from concrete to feathers in a split second. Yeah. That describes, doesn't it, cross country yeah. riding. So if he says, I'm going to go left, no concrete. Oh, well, I've got to look, feathers. It's all got to be so instinctive. Yeah. And you can't offer, because if you offer, you unplug. It's got to be all done from here because Classically, your elbows are by your side, yeah? yeah? And that keeps you plugged in. It's the same jumping. If you offer, you unplug. Yeah. So it's got to be fingers, and that goes against the generation, the last two generations that have learnt you don't let go of the reins. It's really interesting. So I always say if the first fence is lovely, well, isn't that great? That sets you on a good tone for the rest of the course. The first fence is chaos, so long as you haven't fallen off or he's fallen over, and that has happened. Um, good, it'll wake you up, it'll wake him up, and you can get moving to the next fence. But again, how fast you go is the type of horse you've got, and whether you're trying to beat the clock or not. There's a lot of talk in, correct me if I'm wrong, in dressage about rhythm. Yes. And there's a lot of talk in cross country about rhythm, and I never talk about it. Because I find you spend your time on a cross country course breaking the rhythm. Because if you just kept going in the same rhythm, you wouldn't be able to prepare your horse for a coffin. You wouldn't be able to get, pick up a bit of time over a steeplechase fence. You wouldn't be able to get him accurate on an angle combination. So you're constantly galloping and breaking the rhythm and bringing this 14 foot horse back to 10 foot. So you have hopefully had a successful clear round cross country and not got too wet in the water behind us. Um, what do you do now? So you, you've, you've come to, you've called the horse down. Well, you, you haven't, you're about to call the horse down. What do you do? Where do you, where do you finish? Everybody has their own ways of doing it, but the first thing we'll do, even before we let the girths down, is take the boots off their legs because of the overheating that boots can cause. Then we'd loosen the girth, we'd do the nose band, we'd make sure the lower strap, if he has a, a, a grackle or a flash, wasn't flapping around. I've seen a buckle go into an eye and the eye has to be taken out. You get your washing down, done. Sometimes you still need to keep walking them around a bit. And these days, and my goodness, has been through 
so many different uh, temperatures of water you should use. I came in with you using water that was the chill was taken off warm water now it's ice cold not just cold ice cold and you just keep putting it on you don't even have to scrape it off anymore that's the latest thing you just keep piling the water on because you're trying especially if it's a very hot day and this applies obviously to a, a higher level trying to bring the body temperature of the horse down as quickly as you can very interesting we must chat again charlie we have a lot to share uh, yes thank you <laughs>